For the proclamation of the Word of God this morning, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 13 to 17. If you need the Pew Bibles, you'll find that begins on page 1294. come before the Lord in prayer, asking his blessing upon this means of grace. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge you today as we have already several times, our King and our Lord, the very head of the church. We come before your holy word today, O oh Lord, the word you've given to your church by your spirit, and you have called unto us even as you call unto us this day, that the one who has ears to hear must hear what the Spirit says to the church. Lord Jesus, bring this, your word, unto us today. May it be brought to our hearts and with understanding, with conviction. May it be brought with grace and tenderness. And may it work in us what is necessary that we might be further conformed to your image, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the one who was humiliated, the one who was submissive, and the one who is now exalted, that for your sake we may follow in your footsteps. Grant to us today, we pray, much needed grace, for it is you that we seek to honor and glorify. Amen. This is the word of God, beginning in verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Thus saith the Lord. Well, the passage before us this morning goes without saying. It is a difficult one. Not, I believe, because of any difficulty in interpreting it. But because of the anti-Christian political climate in which we live today and in which the church, it seems, has ever lived, which makes it difficult for us to believe that a passage like this actually means what it says. We come to a passage like this and even Romans 13, which I read earlier in the service, and we might ask such questions as these. Does Christ really mean for his followers to give honor to leaders who do not honor him? Does Christ really mean for his people to obey the earth's kings when he alone is our king and the king over all kings? Does Christ really mean for his people to pay taxes to a government when those taxes are not only gratuitous so often, but when that revenue is used in turn for things like abortion and the indoctrination of our children in lies? Does Christ really call his disciples to submit to secular authorities and laws when their real citizenship is in heaven and when he came to set them free from bondage? These are good questions. These are questions faced by our Christian brethren throughout the world in every age. These are the kinds of questions I assume, faced by the believers to whom Peter wrote this letter. These are questions faced by us still today. These are questions that our children and our grandchildren will face until the kingdom of Christ replaces the earth's kingdoms. These are questions of conscience and challenge. But it's important that we don't get off track and come to to verses like this looking for justification for our political viewpoint. And worst of all, 
looking for justification for our resistance to and our murmuring against the government that God has given us. God knows the tensions and hardships faced by his people in the New Testament days under the tyrannical, Christ-hating, Christian-crucifying, and Christian-burning Nero when he used Peter to write these words. And to the church of that day, the Lord said to them, Be subject, honor the emperor. And God knows the tensions and hardships faced by his people still today under a liberal, immoral, Christ-rejecting government. And still he says to us in these verses today, be subject, honor the emperor. And so the disposition that we need is not that of a Republican or that of a political conservative or that of a supporter of people promising greatness by politics. And certainly not that of a murmurer who complains instead of prays. No, the disposition that we need today is the disposition that we need every day. The disposition of a child of God coming to this passage not to learn what our government should do to us and for us so that we can demand it. But rather to learn what God would have us do. And the kinds of citizens that he would have us be in a world that he knows all too well hates his anointed and persecutes his people, a world that is not their home and a world that will never, ever be their heaven. And of course, that means there will always be tensions. As I said already, our children and grandchildren will face the same questions as we do and those before us have. There will always be tensions. There will always be questions about how to apply God's word to our own sociopolitical situation. But the key in this discussion is to remember that however complex the application is, the duty to which God calls us is clear. Now, given the way Peter writes, we've been in Peter now for some time, and you've got a feel for the way he approaches his epistle it makes sense to consider this passage in the same two parts. We've considered a lot of the sections in this epistle. And that is looking at our duty as believers and then the motives that Peter gives us in support of it. So let's start as Peter does with the duty itself. Look at verses 13 to 14. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open. It says, Be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors. You may remember that when we started this epistle together, I told you that the three most important words in 1 Peter are way of life or conduct, as you see it often listed in the ESV, way of life, be subject to, and suffer. Those are the three most important words in 1 Peter. And it's that second word that comes into the forefront in this new section. Verse 13, be subject to every human institution. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters. Chapter 3, verse 1, and also verse 5, wives be subject to your own husbands. Clearly, this is the imperative that governs this whole section. We come to a section now in 1 Peter about submission, about subjection, about honor, honoring the authorities over us. Peter calls us to submission then in this passage and in this entire section. He calls us, first of all, to submission as citizens to our government and then as servants to our masters and then as wives to our husbands. Why does Peter call the church to submission? Well, because our respectful Christ-like submission to God-given authority is one of the primary ways in which we proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of our sinful darkness into the light of his mercy and grace. Remember verse 9? In other words, there is no such thing as a God-honoring, Christ-like life of holiness without godly, Christ-like submission to God-given authorities. You remember that passage in Luke where we read of our Savior at such a young age who went home from the temple when he thought when he was ready to be about his father's business and his parents did not understand and they called him home, we read, and he was submissive to them. 
employ the theology and the praxology in that one verse. He was submissive to his parents. And we see Christ submitting throughout his life. Because the reality is, whoever rules, and this is what Peter gets at, and Paul as well, whoever rules over us, they have been raised up to that honor and to that station over us, not by chance, not even by votes, but by God. By God's will and God's providence, he works behind the voting boxes and where there are no voting boxes. In any and all governments, it is the Lord who raises up leaders. Remember he called Cyrus his servant? He raised up Cyrus to do a great work for his church. Now what does it mean to be subject to or submit? Interchangeable terms, of course, depending on your Bible translation. Well, given that all of us are under one authority or another, you'd think that this is a word that doesn't need to be defined. We know what it means to submit, to be subject to. But sadly, this is a duty that pulls the carpet out from underneath the feet of our pride and cuts across the grain of our selfishness so painfully that we do need to be reminded of what it means. Because we are all so ready to look for reasons and excuses to justify our lack of submission to authority. We're all very fond of autonomy. In fact, we're so fond of autonomy that submission is something we all secretly hate. Nobody likes being told what to do. Nobody. Essentially, though, to submit means to yield to authority. It means to give obedience to the person or institution that God has placed over us. But it doesn't just mean the external outward obedience. It also means something internal and something with regard to treatment and behavior. Because it also means respecting and honoring the persons who hold those offices. And if we can't do it for the person's sake, then we at least can do it for the office's sake. Which is why verse 17 adds the imperative, honor the emperor as a person. We might put there, honor Nero considering his audience. And that means it is a sin to speak ill of the persons who rule over us. It is a sin to disrespect and to show them irreverence or disrespect, to slander or curse them, regardless of how poorly they have behaved as our rulers. It's just simply not right. It's not becoming of a Christian. James might say to us, my brothers, these things ought not to be. And that reminds us of a fundamental principle of the Christian life, and I'm sure I will say this more than once this morning. A fundamental principle of the Christian life is this. Our duty to God is never dependent upon the duty of others toward us before God. Whatever those over us do or don't do, we are to do our duty all the same. Now, we know that with regard to our children. Regardless of how poorly we may behave as parents, they still need to obey. Wives understand that. Regardless of how bad of a husband you may have, you are called to respect and honor him. Well, it applies here, too, with regard to our government. We see this in Acts 23 when Paul repented of speaking ill of the high priest who had ordered him to be hit in the mouth. Remember, Paul spoke in return. But then when it was pointed out that that was the high priest, Paul ate his own words, if you will. Despite how out of line the high priest was, Paul remembered what God says to him in the scriptures. We are not to curse our rulers, Exodus 22. And of course, who is Paul? We see this preeminently in John 19 when our Lord Jesus submits to Pilate in the Roman government despite how unjustly they were treating him. And do you remember the words? Do you remember the reason Christ gave in John 19, 11? This was his reason. The reason he was submitting. Christ recognized that his Father in heaven had given Pilate authority over him. Just sit with that for a moment. Now, did you notice in verse 13 that Peter says we are to be subject to every human institution. 
Unfortunately, Christians have the tendency to imagine that God favors one party over another or even one government over another. As if what God says here about submission only applies to a Republican government, but not to a Democratic government. Or as if the call to be subject to the governor and to honor the magistrate doesn't apply in the case of a tyrannical government or a communist government or a socialist government. That's when these verses don't apply. Surely God doesn't mean us to submit in those cases. But I wonder if we have forgotten again that when this was written, Nero was emperor and demanded worship as God. The same Nero who crucified Christians, soaked them in oil and burned them alive like lanterns on a stick and threw our brothers and sisters to the lions to be ripped and shredded and torn to pieces and eaten. That was the context. It's very clear from Scripture that God cares very much about church government. I believe God tells us exactly what church government should look like. But he has left civil societies around the world to form their own governments, which is why Peter calls them human institutions in verse 13. They're divinely and providentially ordained and appointed, but they are still human institutions, voted on and chosen and established by a society. And he uses the word every to inform us that regardless of what that government, government may be under which we find ourselves, it is still our Christian duty to be subject to it. It is still our Christian duty to be a good and honorable citizen. And again, our duty before God is never dependent on whether or how well others do their duty. Which is why the humble heart comes to Scripture not so much to learn what his superiors owe him, but rather what he owes them. Speak, Lord, your servant listens. Tell me what you want me to do. Remember Peter? What about him? He says of John. Remember Jesus? Don't worry about John. You worry about you. What is your duty? By God's grace and spirit, the humble heart desires to be guided in the way of obedience. We don't stand upon our rights as Christians. You owe me. We're to stand upon our duties. I owe you. Now, of course, we all have questions about what this looks like in practice. And those are the questions and the cases of conscience for which we need the wisdom, the humility, and the grace of Christ, who, as Peter will say next, left us an example that we might follow in his footsteps. But what we need to understand from this passage is this. We can't answer any question of practice without first admitting this fundamental principle of Christian duty. Christians are called to be government-supporting, law-abiding citizens. Because whatever the practice looks like, the practice has to be determined by the principle. So we begin with the principle. That's how Peter begins. That's how God's word begins. Well, as we've seen before, Peter's exhortations always come with motives. He wants to encourage us to obedience. And to, so to support this call and duty to submission, Peter gives us several motives. I'm going to change the order for emphasis. So the first thing I want to look at is this. Notice what Peter says. The first motive in support of a call to submission is this. God, civil government is God's institution. It's just that simple. That's what it says. It's what it says here, and it's what it said in Romans 13 as well. In verse 14, Peter says, Governing authorities, whoever they are, and whatever kind of government, they are sent by God. That word him there doesn't refer to the magistrate or the governor. It refers to God. It's God who sends. Governing authorities are sent by God, and Peter says they're sent for this purpose, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. In other words, God has ordained civil government for the good of society. Go back to Romans 13 and see that more clearly. In his wise providence, he guides men in establishing their own governments. Or as Paul puts in Romans 13, it is God, notice, says Paul, who puts a sword into the hand of every magistrate. He gives magistrates 
the right and the authority to govern in a way, to govern in such a way over their society that those who do criminal evil are punished and those who do law-abiding good are encouraged and rewarded. So that as Paul says, they are God's ministers. Did you see that word? Paul used it a couple of times. Ministers, servants. It's a powerful term, isn't it? You can see the connotations it brings in your mind already. They are God's ministers. They are raised up by God in society to to do God's bidding. He has given them a charter, a charge to do good, to rule righteously, to protect, to punish the evil, to reward the good. Now, of course, we could argue whether or not our government is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And whether or not our governors are walking in a manner worthy of their office, which would make submission both easy and delightful. But frankly, that's beside Peter's point. That's not Peter's point at all. He's not on that page. We would like him to be because that would justify some of our feelings. But rather, Peter is talking to us about our duty as those under government. He's addressing the church. Who lives under government. And our duty is not dependent upon our governments, but rather our duty, says Peter, is dependent upon one thing, that government is God's institution. And again, that simply means that the governments of society have divine warrant and they have authority to govern, to legislate, to judge, to rule, to tax, to punish, to protect. And if we're honest, However deformed and corrupt a government may be, there is some good in every government. Even the worst tyranny is better than anarchy. So that, yes, even a tyrant is to be honored and obeyed if God puts him in power over us. And so before we criticize our governments for how far they fall short of their duty... We should humbly realize and give thanks to God for all the good that they do and all the evil that they restrain. We have much to be thankful for in our land, in particular, that God has given us a government which protects us from the violence of the ungodly so that the wicked are not allowed to do what they please. We can be thankful for that. And what's more, there's also comfort under this motive, and I don't want us to miss this. This is important. Because if civil governments and magistrates are set up by God with this good purpose as their charter, then it means they're accountable to God for their governing. That's a blessing. Because one day, every governing official will have to answer to the Lord himself for how he governed. He's got to give an account of that charge. Because that charge is from the Lord. He is God's minister over society to carry out God's will. So that when we find ourselves being oppressed by unjust laws and mistreated for our allegiance and alliance to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can take comfort knowing that just as it was with our brethren in Egypt, the Lord hears our cries, the Lord sees our sufferings, the Lord knows our rulers by name, And the Lord will one day right every wrong, and he will bless his people with a righteous governance over them when Christ comes again. And so we're to be subject to our civil government because God has placed it over us to govern us in this world. A second reason Peter gives us, a second motive and reason, is that by doing good, he says, we will silence our accusers. Now, one of the most false and yet most common prejudices against Christianity and against Christians is that because Jesus alone is our king and because we are exiles in this present evil world, that this is not our home, that we are strangers and foreigners here, that therefore we are an enemy to this world's government and this world's powers. They said this of the Jews in the days of Ezra, you remember, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 15. They said it of the apostles in Acts chapter 21, 28. And no wonder they said it of the Lord Jesus Christ as well in Luke 23, verse 5. He stirs up the people. And so Peter says it's to silence our accusers 
that we are to be subject to governing authorities. We silence our accusers by actually being good citizens and honoring those whom the Lord has placed over us. It reminds us of the Lord's charge upon his people when they were in exile in Babylon. How often I think we forget this. His people are in Babylon, a pagan land, not their home. And you remember what God tells them in Jeremiah 29, 7? Seek the welfare of this city. Seek the welfare of this city. The church was to seek the welfare of Babylon. Why? Because they lived there. And they were to set an example. An example of their honor to God over Babylon. But also an example that their hope is not in this world. And what that meant for the Jews then is the same thing it means for us now. Do good in your city. Be good in your city. And pray for the Lord's good to come upon your city. It reminds us also of Paul's charge to us in 1 Timothy 2. Paul's instruction to the church is this. He says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, for this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. You see, we can't live a good and peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, if we're not praying for those in authority over us, thankful for their, what they're doing for the good of the people and the good of society, honoring God. You see, part of our gospel witness in the world is found in our honoring those in authority over us, respecting them, speaking kindly of them, praying for them, Obeying their laws, insofar, of course, as they don't call us to disobey the laws of our God, because that's the one place where we must refuse compliance. Peter is not thinking of that here, but that, of course, is the case. I'll come back to that. Picture it this way. As I said earlier, the heart of every man is filled with such selfishness and such pride that he hates to submit. He hates to be told what to do. He hates to be under authority. He hates to be bound by laws. He wants to jump over every single fence you put in his way. Tell him what not to do. It's the very thing he wants to do. That's the heart of man. And so he constantly kicks against authority. He murmurs under authority. He is ready to justify every disobedience against authority. We know this is true of man because we know it's true of our own hearts. We're all the same. Well, imagine that context, and it's among that kind of people that we live. How beautifully, then, does it adorn the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ before a watching world when we submit to the rulers that God has ordained over us, especially in the face of injustice and cruelty and hardship when every man is ready to justify his rebellion and when the church doesn't. The third reason Peter gives is because we should live as those who are free in Christ. Now, there were some among the church then, just as there are some among the church still. There will always be such. They claim that their freedom in Christ is a freedom from all submission. After all, John 8, 36 says, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. As if that freedom that the gospel brings is a freedom to be a law unto yourself. It was Luther who said that we are a servant of none are subject to none, but a servant of all, for Christ's sake. You see, what Peter reminds us here then is what Paul often reminded his readers, that what we have in Christ is a spiritual freedom from sin, the greatest bondage, from the tyranny of our own lust, and it's not a freedom to do as we want. It's a freedom from sin as much as a freedom unto obedience. So that in this context, we've been freed from sin to obey God. And this is his commandment, that we be subject to every human institution as instituted by him for our good. And if you can see it, this beautifully reveals a mutual restriction in the civil sphere. Don't miss this. A mutual restriction in the civil sphere. On the one hand, 
Our conscience is limited by our governing authorities. We can't do whatever we want. But on the other hand, the governing authorities are also limited by our conscience because they can't force us to sin against God. And of course, the reason for this mutual restriction is because both our conscience and our governing authorities are ultimately limited by God himself. God's behind both. His word governs all. His rule is over all. And so for our part, Peter is telling us, rather than living as if our freedom in Christ gives us the right to disobey our governing authorities, Peter says we are to live as those who understand that what Christ frees us from is the sin of disobeying those who are in authority over us. In other words, we submit to civil government as and because we are followers of King Jesus. In Christ, we are freed from the sins of disobedience and rebellion in order to obey our God-given authorities in all things not sinful. We're free from that rebellion. We're free from that resistance. And we're free to obey as God would have us to his honor and glory. Peter actually gives three more motives. Each of these is so important that it could carry the whole weight of the exhortation by itself. So don't let how quickly I go through them lead you to think them trivial. In fact, maybe the less I say about them, the better you'll remember them for what they are in themselves. And we'll close after this. The next motive Peter gives is in verse 13, for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. Why would you submit to a government in which your governors set themselves up, sometimes as God, and in either case, always against the Lord and his anointed Psalm 2? Why in the world would you submit? For the Lord's sake. That's why. That's the reason we do anything and everything, isn't it? Civil governments may be human institutions, and its governors may be men and sinful ones at that. And our government may not be living up to its calling, its divine purpose. Yet, since our Lord has ordained it to have authority over us, and since our Lord has ordained it for our good and for the good of our society, and since our Lord has commanded us to submit to it, then for his sake, we are to submit ourselves unto it. You see, however difficult the implementation of it is, that's the principle that has to be implemented. We need wisdom for that implementation. We need much prayer for that implementation. But it's the principle, which is as clear as a bell, that we're trying to apply and implement. Secondly, verse 15, we're to submit because it's the will of God. And is this not the strongest and most binding reason you can give a child of God whose heart is resigned and resolved to live for God, that it's God's will for him? It may not suit his own pleasure. It may not serve his own private interest, and it may cost him greatly. But if his heart is bound by the will of God, then once he knows something to be God's will, his course is clear. And by the grace of God, he will both will it and do it. Not because it's easy. Not because it's popular. Not because it'll get him praise or profit. Not because it's convenient. But simply because in the civil sphere, it is the will of God that we obey the will of men. For as Paul says in Romans 13, God put those men in authority over us, which means submission to God necessarily involves submission to the men he's placed over us. And the third reason is in verse 17, and that is because you're a God-fearing man or woman. You're a God-fearer. In verse 17, you can see Peter gives us these four rapid-fire imperatives. And I think it's clear that it, he means it to be a summary of what he's been saying because he ends the way he began with the charge to honor the emperor. 
He comes back full circle, I think. But in the middle of that list, if you will, we find this charge. Fear God. And I offer that to you this morning as Peter's final motive. Because if you fear God, then you'll strive by his grace to please him. And in this context, pleasing God means submitting to civil authorities for his sake as what it means to live honorable lives among men. Verse 12. And part of what it means to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 9. See, Peter has set this up for us. He has been leading up to this challenging passage that strikes the church of every age with difficulty because of our own sinful hearts. He has prepared the way, and now he brings us to it. Now let me conclude this morning in this way. It should be clear, and I made mention of this already, if we're to submit to our governing authorities for the Lord's sake, then it's obvious that we can't submit to them in anything that's against the Lord's commands. We're submitting to the government because God is above them. And therefore, we can't submit to anything what they charge us that is against the God, our God, who is above them. When our magistrates and our rulers, whoever they may be in whatever government, when they command us to sin against God, then they've overstepped their bounds. And we must obey God rather than men. But apart from sin, which is Peter's assumption here, Peter's not assuming that that is the case, which is why he comes across so black and white as he does. Apart from sin, obeying men that God puts over us, says Peter, is obeying God. And if that means we must suffer the wrath of men, then we can suffer the wrath of men with a clear conscience before God, assured that God will give us the grace to submit ourselves to the very sword that he puts in their hands even if it's being used wrongly against us for doing good and not evil. As has been the case with so many of our brethren throughout the church's history, even unto our own day. But unless our government requires us to do what God forbids, or forbids us to do what God requires, then we are to honor and obey our civil authorities for the Lord's sake. This is not only the apostolic mandate, It's not only the apostolic apostolic example in the book of Acts, but it is our Lord's own example, as any cursory reading of the Gospels will show. And so when you feel like speaking ill of your government, remember these verses, and don't say anything that won't square with what it means to honor them. When you feel like justifying your disobedience to the government because it's run by sinful, God-hating humans who don't deserve your obedience, remember that for all its flaws and even for all its evils, civil government is a divine institution that you're commanded to submit to for the Lord's sake, regardless of the ungodliness of its rulers. That doesn't come into account in your duty. When you feel like complaining about its laws and its taxes and its regulations. Remember that Christ himself rendered to Caesar what was Caesar's. And now he calls you to do the same. For his sake. Not for Caesar's sake. For his sake. Because he did it likewise for the Father's glory. When you feel like murmuring and complaining about how things are run, remember that a bad government can't justify your sinning against it. And that things might actually change for the better if you turn that murmuring into praying, as we've seen by God's grace in recent days. And let me just remind you that one of the reasons, one of the reasons, one of the reasons Christians are the worst complainers about the government and its ungodliness is because we fall into the trap of we still look for a political Messiah. That's part of the church's problem. We're looking for a political Messiah. Surely we can vote someone in who will give us a heaven on earth after all and make everything just go great and give the church all of its privileges and give us all the freedom to do everything nice and good. 
I would encourage you to be aware of that, beloved. Be aware of trading the glory of Christ's coming kingdom for cheap earthly imitations. You don't want a heaven here. You don't want an earthly Messiah. You don't want a political Messiah. We can't. We don't want to dishonor Christ's present reign as king because it is a present reign as king. We don't want to dishonor Christ's present reign as king by trying to vote in a king of our own. What does that say to the Lord Jesus? When we treat those instances and situations as if we have found someone who will finally rule righteously. Is not your Savior ruling righteously today? Was he not ruling righteously yesterday, last year? He's always ruling righteously. He has ever ruled righteously. He will rule today. He will rule tomorrow until this world is over. Don't behave in such a way in your politics and in your voting and in all those things in such a way as if you forget that you have a king, you have a Messiah, and he is gloriously and beautifully reigning over this world and its governments. Now, of course, we can complain to God about our government. Absolutely. Let us complain. Indeed, it is right to cry out in the face of injustice and evil. Absolutely. But let us not be surprised, and often I think the church is, and it shouldn't be, but let us not be surprised when a government with no higher aspirations than this world acts in a worldly way with worldly ends in mind and view. They're doing exactly what they're going to do. It's as high as they can reach. That's as far as they can see. Don't be surprised when the best men voted into office by you prove to be mere men at best. Still, just a man. And if we might say, unfortunately, just a politician. And finally... When we find ourselves suffering for righteousness' sake under our government, let us remember that this is God's way of reminding us that we are not to look for a kingdom here, that we are not to look for a political Messiah to Christianize our world so that we can feel like we're in heaven. Because this world is not our home. And no political party or candidate will ever be the church's vanguard for a heaven on earth. It is not going to happen. God will see to it. And why would it happen? Christ came and shed his blood and died to establish his kingdom. Why would God allow us another? Need we another? We need another kingdom like we need another king. We already have a king and his name is Jesus. He's a king who rules over us in righteousness and justice. He delivers the oppressed. He sets the prisoners free. Go back to Luke chapter 4. His heart is full of compassion. His laws are not burdensome. His laws are liberating and delightful. His yoke is lined with silk. And he rules over us even now. He rules in heaven over every king and every governor and every government on earth, turning their hearts as it pleases him. And he governs over them with such glorious and wonderful and praiseworthy sovereignty that for all their rage against the Lord and his anointed and for all of their laws and legislations in efforts to thwart his will, it is all the while his will that they end up doing. God is never surprised By legislations passed, God is never surprised by people being voted in to rule. He is at work. And the wheels of providence are moved and turned by his Holy Spirit in every sphere, in all the world, and certainly in every government and governor. Now, beloved, it is hard sometimes to submit to our government as it is hard to submit to parents and hard to submit to husbands and hard to submit to elders. Submission is hard. And it's hard here in this area. Our Lord knows this, and I want you to know that. Don't forget your Lord knows how hard it is. This is one of the greatest comforts the Bible gives us. He knows He has been touched with your infirmities. 
do not forget that your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ submitted to being arrested by men and bound, though innocent. He submitted to being beat by soldiers, though worthy of their worship. He submitted to being crucified by a Roman governor, though Lord over him. Christ knows how hard it is to submit. And yet he would call us to follow his example. We will see as we get into the next passage, this is the center of all of this section. That he left us an example that we might follow in his footsteps. That is at the heart of this entire passage. Everything comes back to that. Your Lord Jesus would have you follow his example. And as you do, he would have you remember and rejoice that his humiliation under our civil governments is over. And that now he reigns over all governments, using them for his glory and for your good. In fact, that's why we can submit, even if it means our hurt or our death, because he is reigning over our government for our good. So don't be rebellious because God rules over your government. And if you're called to suffer for righteousness sake, don't be afraid because God will overrule your government for your good. And don't despair under hard, unjust, wicked rulers and laws because the king of righteousness is coming. And he'll bring a governance which is perfect in holiness and goodness and grace. And of that government, there will be no end. And peace will reign forever in the hearts and lives of all those who have waited for him and his kingdom. And therefore we say with the church of all ages, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh, gracious and almighty God, we thank you this morning for your word and that it has been graciously accompanied by your spirit who alone can bring it deeper than our minds and our ears, even down to our very hearts. We pray this morning that we have not only heard these words, but that the same spirit who gave us ears to hear will be the spirit who sanctifies us and conforms us unto the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, we long to walk in his footsteps. We long to follow his example. Grant to us wisdom and discernment that we may know the course before us. May we not stand upon our rights, O oh Lord, but may we stand upon our duties, giving ourselves fully and sincerely unto the work you've given us to do, leaving each man to himself as it were, that we may see to our own walk before your very eyes, that we may live and walk before your eyes as citizens with a clear conscience. This we pray, for this you have promised. In Jesus' name, amen.